All right. Hello and welcome to Backstage with Gig Performer. My name is Brett Pontecorvo and we are here every Thursday, 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, talking about all things Gig Performer, live performance, tips and tricks. It's always a really awesome time. And one of the things that makes it such an awesome time is that we have such amazing and awesome guests coming on and today is no exception we've got dave bolden coming in he's going to be talking all about playing tunes with his cover band which i've recently found out that i cannot pronounce correctly so i'm going to let him come on and tell us all about it in a second but we've got links in the description uh, we have heard some of his music this is the party band of all party bands um, so if you haven't checked out what they're doing this is all top shelf stuff and it's powered by gig performers so we're going to hear all about that but since today we're going to be talking a lot about set lists go ahead and let us know in the comments right now are you performing using set lists are you controlling gig performer from some third party software perhaps um, a lot of people like to use Fourscore or mobile sheets or maybe you're using you know whatever it is maybe you're sending program changes let us know how you are handling that in the comments. Um, I see we've got Simon Bywater here. Welcome, Simon. Welcome, John. Thomas Bishop, Oscar. Um, so happy to have you guys here. Um, I've got somebody writing in saying that Thomas Bishop loves set lists. That's great. Thomas, we're so glad that you do. Um, I don't want to spoil too much, but Dave has come up with an amazing solution for handling that. Now, typically speaking, we are live on Thursdays. However, this coming Saturday, we have Sam Samson Anderson coming on, who is doing amazing things with Max for Live, integrating with Gig Performer. Um, not to mention the fact that he is an exceptional musician, uh, wonderful um, at just kind of exploring what is possible. So um, thank you all for being here with us today. Um, and yeah, oh, we've got one in. Using setlist view from Oscar, controlling from assigned pedal and button. Yeah, that's super uh, common. A lot of times, if you really know what's coming, um, you're able to do that. Um, so awesome to hear that you're using setlists. Uh, generally, my go-to is to use a setlist. If it's not in Gig Performer, it's you know on a printed piece of paper. Um, but you know, all right. Matt Keys is here. Welcome, Matt. I'm going to welcome on Dave, and we're going to get this party started. Um, so welcome to the Backstage with Gig Performer stream. Uh, Dave, how you doing, man? I'm good, thanks, Brett. It's it's almost as though we've done this before in the last it's, 12 hours. <laughs> Dave and I have tested this stream more times than any Backstage stream in the history of Backstage with Gig Performer. So special thanks to Dave for all of that. Um, Dave. Say your band's name for me again. Uh, Marilabone Jelly. Marilabone Jelly. There you go. Um, for weeks, I've been saying this incor incorrectly. Um, okay, before we jump down all of the Marilabone Jelly stuff, for people who maybe don't know what you do, what do you do? Who are you? What's your day job? Like, get us up to date with all things, Dave. Um, okay. Um, a day job is uh, I'm a programmer. I run my own uh, IT company. I uh, started off um, uh, at a local council uh, where I was trained, but I soon moved to one of the daily newspapers. And I spent a good 14 years working for one of the national UK newspapers. Wow. Uh, got used to programming under pressure because the deadlines were daily. And this kind of put me in good stead from then on. Um, then started my own company in 2001 and provide software still sometimes to the newspaper industry, but to a wider set of companies as well, moved into websites and stuff. But uh, uh, alongside that, I've always played music uh, as almost like a second job. It's it's like one of those hobbies you get paid for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, Mary Lebone Jelly has found fantastic success. Uh, yeah, we, we are busy. I mean, this year we're probably approaching 90 gigs for the year, which is, it's, 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 it's a lot when you have day jobs, but we love what we do and we, we, we do that. Yeah. Congratulations. That's like a massive, a massive accomplishment. You guys should be super proud. Um, okay. So why, why do you think you're seeing the type of success you're seeing with your band? 
Like, what's the magic mix of ingredients going on with what you're doing? I'm just just out of curiosity, because to be clear, you guys are a cover party band. Yeah. Um, the main thing is do it like you mean it. Um, okay. It, it, and we all play um, uh, uh, some Guns N' Roses and then go straight into some erasure mm -hmm. and we will we'll play both like we mean it uh we own the songs it's uh, it's as simple as that if you if you don't look like you're enjoying yourself you can't expect the audience to to enjoy themselves as well yeah absolutely um <clears throat> i love how simple your answer is <laughs> but yeah I, like... I always think it's not rocket science but it's yeah. uh, obviously there are always caveats to that but um generally that's that's a, that's our approach yeah that's amazing when did you guys start playing together um three of us actually have played together in a previous band okay um and the remnants of two bands that folded at the same time formed to make marylebone jelly in 1997 wow. so myself the singer ed and the drummer neil uh, we we were founder members of the band and yeah we're still going yeah that's amazing um so we're going to talk about gig performer but like for those of us who are running you know bands who are gigging you know doing this type of thing what what keeps the internal workings of the band strong like how do you guys manage like relating to each other well and rehearsing all of the stuff that like makes the actual work that you do fun um being friends for, yeah. for is the first thing um we we rehearse actually here in the studio i mean at the moment this is yeah. my home studio beautiful so rehearsals are less hassle because uh over the side there there's an electronic drum kit behind me there's a bass a bass amp over there there's a guitar amp so the guys just bring them my instrument plug in uh, so we can turn up and be rehearsing within three minutes yep um so we typically would only spend an hour and a half once a week um to do what we need to do um but really it's, it's communication between us we all have our set jobs that we do our singer ed is very good at promoting the band he handles our facebook account and bookings and uh and dealing with um the various festivals we play and things um uh, myself and the guitarist are good on the technical side uh, our bass player is excellent on stage setup. He gets on, does the job. He can also lift heavy things, which makes him brilliant. Yes. Uh, our drummer for, for many, many years was doing the bookings and that it's, uh, yeah, everyone has their pre predefined job. We do it and it just works like a well old machine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you like the people you work with, everything is much easier, isn't it? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. So <clears throat> what, when, when you're rehearsing too, like <clears throat> what are the things that you're constantly refining? Uh, I'm assuming most of what you're doing at this point is keeping your material sharp. Uh, yeah. And also a, a bit of turnover of the materials and new stuff. I think it's when we go back to a bar that we played sort of like four or five months ago, you want to have some new stuff that they didn't hear last time. So we keep a little bit of churn, a bit of turnover going. Um, but really, we between us, we decide what are good new songs to do. We all go away, do our homework. And typically, when we come into the rehearsal room, we can play right th the, thong, the song straight through. Um, mm -hmm. And then it's just deciding how we want to start and end the song. Do we want to change the arrangement? And just having a clear idea of what's the best mix and arrangement of parts, everyone knowing what part they're going to cover before we turn up at the rehearsal room. And you're the keyboard player, so they're like, all right, Dave, you're going to play bass, you're going to play saxophone, you're going to play organ, you're going to play keyboard and spoons. All, uh, all of those, never bass. <laughs> yeah, never bass, right, exactly. <laughs> I once ended up doing a show where I had to play left-hand bass for a musical. Yeah. And it was like so much material that it was written in three staves. Bass and then two parts for keyboards in one book. Who wrote that? Anyway, sidebar. But the demands on keyboard players are insane. So what what were you doing pre-gig performer? 
Uh, I had um, uh, this this little machine down here. I had the Kronos yep. um, on the bottom, and I had a, a Roland Phantom on top. Um, typically, for years, I've had a Korg on my lower keyboard weighted and a Roland on the t as a top keyboard semi-weighted. So I've got the two, the two gotcha. styles of keyboard. And um, talking to each other through program changes, or how are you dealing with... No, I'd, pro I'd just change sounds. I both have pretty good set list functionality built in okay. where I can just, I only have to page across about two or three pages of a bank of 16 sounds to have access to everything. So I was dialing up stuff by hand between songs. Uh, well, I say between songs, it'd be a case of getting the page ready, knowing what's going to go next. And then as we start the song, bang, hit the sound yeah, uh, and use that. Yeah. So I'm assuming let's like back all the way up. It's the year is, you know, 1998, you're one year in. At this point, were you guys using in-ear monitors to communicate or was there another system? No, we, okay. we, we, we barely had stage monitors. It was, okay. um, um, they, there's not really as much need for communication between us during the show. We know what happens. We're well versed. I mean, we gig on average once or twice a week. So it's it, it, most things can be done on a nod and a wink. Um, okay. When somebody goes early into a part or something, we all follow. It's just right. it we 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 act, we perform as a band as opposed to a you know four four or five musicians on the same stage. Yes. Yeah. So even so now obviously years later you guys are on in your monitors. There's much more tech, and I would say tech is much more easily accessible. It's still yeah. a nod and a wink, even when you're calling things spontaneously. You're just kind of like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I know what you're going to do. Yeah. Uh, Ed has this brilliant thing of uh, he has some little mimes. Ed is our lead singer. Uh, he has little mimes for things we're going to do. I mean, when he does this, we're going to do Walk Like an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. When he does this, uh, he's shaking a ta it's miming of shaking a tambourine. I know that's uh, going to be Don't Look Back in Anger. Um, so we have a mixture of mimes or when he does this, we're going to play a madness song. It's it. I mean, that, that alone is, is entertaining. Just watching for the, the mimes you get. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's wild. I did an interview recently with somebody and we were just talking about like the, the silent body language that exists between people yeah. who have played together for a long time. Yes. Um, it's kind of this like intangible thing. So you came on to Gig Performer as a response to frustration or you came on to Gig Performer as just kind of curiosity into what was possible? Um, more actually to uh, liberate what I can and can't do. Um, also, there was, I have to say, there, there was the, the other major element of the gear is much lighter. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, when you're carrying around a Kronos and, and a Roland Phantom in big wooden flight cases, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it, it does get tiring. So now I've got a, one of the lightweight Phantom O's um, is my top keyboard, and I have a Studio Logic SL88 as my bottom keyboard. That's not what I have in the studio. In the studio, I use uh, an S90 as my main keyboard. Okay. Um, uh, but again, obviously, the rig manager allows me to s seamlessly swap between the two setups. Yeah, we'll have to link to that in the description. Um, yeah. Rig manager is just such a breath of fresh air for, yeah. for exactly yeah. this situation. So the gear was lighter. Um, how did you hear about it? Um, I have looked at... Um, various different options for live hosts for yeah. many years. Uh, I was one of the people who played around with uh, Brainspawn Forte okay. back, back yep. in the day. Um, I had a Muse Receptor for some while. Yes. Yep. Uh, so, uh, um, I had one of the uh, SM Pro Audio did a little one called a V Machine, which was about this sort of big, about the size of a box of chocolates. Um, it ran Linux and you could get adapter, a software adapters to run various plugins on it. I had that for a while. Um, and I, uh, I've had um, the Camelot, um, Cantabile. Uh, I've tried most of them. Um, I, I actually came to Geek Performer through Plugin Alliance. Okay. Um, and as I got to love it, I actually decided, no, I'm going to buy the actual DSKU version uh the proper version uh just uh, for the better support and uh, and everything goes with it 
Um, yeah, it really, it, it's it's allowed me to do uh, a lot more that that I couldn't do with just the or I could have done with the Kronos and the Phantom, but would have taken a lot more work. Yeah, yeah, um, it's so interesting. You know, it's like when you have a project to work on and you partner that with really capable software, it really yeah. like rips the lid off of what is possible. Um, whereas when you have really powerful software and no project. Yeah. I, I mean, the great thing that appealed to me was that it, um, with the GP script yeah. built in and then also the ability to create extensions to do stuff that's not catered for internally, it appeals to me as a programmer. Cause yeah. I'm thinking, oh, I can make it do that just by pressing that button in the middle of a, a run or something. I know these other amazing things are going to happen automatically. And no one in the audience is going to have the slightest clue that you've, that, that these things have happened automatically, but it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, that even that element is very satisfying as, as a yeah. keys player. Do you, um, did GP script with your coding background feel very natural? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it, it's a very well designed or well structured language that's, it, it, I've got my my most recent background is uh, in web programming, so the idea of callbacks and things are very familiar to me. Um, and one of the first ones I did was uh, for uh, on Hammond sounds to be able to switch the Leslie speed. Uh, I actually now switch it with the pitch bend lever because I could do that on the Kronos. Mm. It was built for that, and it's really easy to quickly whack the pitch bend lever with your hand between runs and that to change the speed. And I missed that. Um, so I thought, well, you can just write a script that will turn pitch bend messages into um, modulation on off messages. And bingo, it's, yeah. uh, I now have that feature back again. Yeah. Um, it's the things like that that you're like, oh. And, and there's such a, a resource in the forums for people who are not coders yeah. getting help, um, yeah. which is awesome. So you've you know, kind of danced around this a little bit, but you know, coding is super important to you. Um, yeah. so you've built out a lot of stuff. We're definitely going to talk about your extension for flexibility, yeah. but, um, can you give us just kind of a, a brief overview of your, your setup, just kind of show us, you know, top down what's going on and then we can kind of dive into the nitty gritty. Does that sound cool? Yeah, sure. All right, yeah. Let's see if I can bring this up. Um, yeah, this is good for now. So I, I can see your performance set up. Tell me what yeah. we're looking at. And actually, do you look at this when you're playing or no? Uh, no, I don't know. I have something else up on the window, uh, which we'll come to uh, shortly. Okay. Um, I, I will use this um, when I'm programming the new sounds. Um, and also at the start of a gig, um, you'll notice on the global rack space at the bottom, um, I've got the little equalizer and that just goes through into a plugin, which is strapped across the, the main output. Mm -hmm. And I can just slightly tweak to, to suit the acoustics of the room we're in. If it's a boomy room, I can drop out some of the low end. Um, so that it, it, it's like just to tweak the sound before we start playing. I don't tweak the sound in terms of EQ and stuff and that as we go along. And also I don't tie them to the rack spaces. Um, because uh, if I want to do something specific in a rack space, I'll just build an EQ into the rack space. So it's just it only exists for that song. Um, and the same with the reverb and the limiter. Uh, the limiter is just there to um, protect the speakers. And the, the reverb, if you're in a hall, I can dial it down a bit. If we're in a function room, which typically is carpeted and curtains and that, I can turn it up a bit just to give it a bit more space to the sound. Yeah. Um, and did this develop over time or was it like by the time you ended up in gig performer, you knew you needed this? Um, it, it developed over time. Okay. I, I always had a similar idea um, uh, when I was with hardware. Um, I would do these kind of tweaks on my sub mixer. Mm -hmm. um, but having it on screen now is, is, is really nice. It, it's, it gives me more scope and capability. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So, and like, is this right now, do you look at that and go, I'm never touching that again. It works for me. Or are there plans to adjust this for something else that you need? Um, uh, never say never. You can always right. come up with a 
excellent, better idea. Um, sure, my sure. global rack space is probably on the probably like the tenth iteration of of how I've set it up. Yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah. If you think of a better idea, or you get a better sounding plugin to put in the chain, then uh, yeah, I I I don't. I, I'm I'm not one of those people who say that works. I'll just leave it. Uh, yes. I will always tinker with stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. So you start a gig, and uh, you start here depending on what the room is. And I guess at this point, you probably knew right away what needs to be tweaked just by looking yeah. at the room. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, what else do you have going on here? Are you, 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 I assume you usually perform in set list view, even though you're not using set lists. Uh, correct. Yes. I, okay. I, I have this view so, the, so that it uh, interacts with the extension in the right way. Gotcha. Um, I always had the notion of having two keyboards. So even now they're kind of virtual, mm -hmm. which is why I have top and bottom mixers in the, in the, um, uh, in the, the top panel there. Yeah. Uh, and the sliders there are just to set the various levels of the splits because I have a lot of splits on keyboards. Yes. And, and it's just, it's a convention I have. It, it, it makes sense to me. Yes. So I always have two mixer plugins in every sound pretty much. And those two will be the various levels between the splits on either keyboard. Are, are, is this convention left over from being a Kronos user? Uh, somewhat, yeah. Yeah. It is a little bit of it, um, but I've I've modified it, and I, I actually sat down and thought, what would be the ideal setup for the way my brain works when I'm doing mm. a gig, um, so that I can set stuff up and do that, and not have to second guess what I'm doing. It's intuitive to the way I work, yes. Uh, which I I find a great feature with GP because you're not railroaded down one route of how you do things. You can mm. set up your own workflow, and and have it work the way you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and do you kind of intuitively know what goes in what zone? Uh, yeah, pretty much. It's uh, it, left to right will be pretty much left to right across the keyboard. So. Gotcha. gotcha. But I really only tweak that when I'm programming, not not when I'm playing. Right, right, right. Um, makes a ton of sense. And the levels are usually, I'm assuming, set well enough that you're not needing to change individual levels at a gig. It's just overall things. Um, no, I've got into a habit now of uh, taking notes on my phone at the end of a gig. I, think, I remember I think uh, that one wasn't quite right, that that sound was a bit too quiet in the mix compared to the other splits. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I encourage, the other guys in the band will give me feedback on that as well. So, no, I couldn't hear that bit properly. And I tweak it. Um, obviously, it was all set on the on the Kronos. I was using it for 12 years nearly. Yes. Um, so I'm getting to that point now where I'm getting the balances between sounds where I want it to be. But I'll always tweak after every every gig if there's stuff that I think needs attention. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And when you move from song to song, your rack space, I assume, stays the same because you don't touch this during a performance. Um, the, uh, obviously the, the, uh, the uh, I, I use the seamless switching stuff. So the, the, um, I have a, I pretty much work on one rack space per song. Yep. Yeah. For my setup. Yep. But you don't have like <clears throat> your front panel in your local rack spaces are not that important to your performance, I guess is what I'm getting at. Uh, no. And yeah. generally they look all look the same. Some will have an extra item on. Uh, anything it uses a vocoder may have an on-off switch for the vocoder microphone, um, mm -hmm. purely so I can actually just map it to something on the hardware. Yes. And do you use a lot of controls? Like, are you a button pusher, knob turner when you're playing or not so much? Uh, not that much, to be honest. Um, I think most of the things I do use will be uh, on my uh, drum pads. Um, so, uh, sometimes I'll mute and unmute one part of a sound, uh, just, just from one of the pads. Mm -hmm. I always have, uh, one of the buttons is the MIDI panic button. Yeah. So if I do get in a complete, it's something, I get a stuck note or something, I've got a hardware button to push to clear all notes. Yep. Um, other than that, play and stop, um, um, A and B variations. Um, that's, that's about the only controls I use. Yeah, and you guys use no tracks, right? No. Yeah, no, no. it's Everything, all live. live. Yeah. So okay. even, even, the, even the arpeggiated stuff is live. Yeah. So, so which, if you're, 
watching right now and you haven't checked out this music, go back and realize it's all being generated live in real time. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible what's, what's happening. Um, so how, how are you handling your arpeggiators? You're just playing the arpeggios or you're, you're having a way to reset the clock to stay in time with the drummer? Yeah, that okay. um, uh, we have. Um, we uh, obviously we know what what the tempo of the song will be. Yeah. Our drummer is extremely good at hitting the right tempo from memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so usually when we are doing something like Radio Gaga, he'll start the beat and I'll do the sequence bass, and I re-trigger every bar or every two bars just to correct any slight drift there might be. And yeah, yeah it works. it's really effective. Like if, if yeah. you're, you know, somewhere about the correct tempo and you're able to reset it and your drummer is, you know, pretty close, it actually works really well. <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's that, a highly effective uh, technique. The trick I find is to find the plugins that, that will re-trigger the clock when you do a note. Mm-hmm. Some will, um, uh, they, it, it won't re-trigger. It'll keep the same uh, tempo, clock cycle going. Yes. And it will drift no matter what. Um, but uh, it, usually it's just a matter of choosing the right latching mode. Yeah. Uh, on what, the what plugins do you recommend for that? Um, uh, I've recently gone to using Omnisphere for, okay. for those kind of things. Um, I, I was reluctant to put Omnisphere on, not because I don't like it. I absolutely adore it. But I, I always had the impression it was very uh, CPU intensive. Um, but now I've upgraded to version two, it turns out it's not as intensive as I thought it was, and it runs absolutely fine, even on my little computer that I, uh, I run GP on. Yes. So you, and you're running on a windows machine and it uh, is not a laptop though. It's no, a, um, it, this is my backup machine. Um, and it's a little small format factor wow. computer. So, mm-hmm. or Lenovo. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it's, I mean, it's loaded with, with, with Ram. It's got 32 gig of Ram in it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it has a core I seven process. So it's, it's a reasonably beefy machine, but it's a small form factor, which just hangs off the side of my keyboard stand when we play. Yeah. And I feel like I've been hearing a decent amount of chatter about this recently. Like, uh, I mean, it's essentially a mini desktop computer, but what's inside of it is not mini, but it's very, it's a very powerful option if you're not yes. wanting to use a laptop and it, the price difference is, is not yeah. something it's, to write home thing, about. The only thing you have to factor in is get, is obviously you have to then buy a separate touch screen, yeah. but that works great for me because the touch screen, uh, I'm actually using it at the moment <laughs> to, to watch the, the, the stream on, um, yeah. I have that uh, attached to the keyboard with magnetic strips. And so right on the, my keyboards, I can dial up, my, uh, I can choose my sounds and do stuff from the touch screen yeah. right there. And it's just one USB-C cable to connect it to the computer. Yep. Yeah. So it's a really great option. Touch screen works great with gig performer. Um, yeah. And even more with some of the other stuff you're going to show us. Okay. Is there anything else before we jump into your extension that we need to see in gig performer to understand the overall flow. Um, maybe I'll quickly show the, uh, the wiring view. Yeah, that'd, that'd be, be super a- helpful. Awesome. So what do we got going on here? Um, uh, well, as you see, there's two audio mixers there. Um, yep. the, the left hand one typically is, will have the, the top keyboard and the right hand one will be the bottom keyboard in the, in the virtual sense. Okay. So as we through different uh, songs. Uh, I mean, that one's a, a, a different because I did it all on one keyboard. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll have stuff going into the bottom keyboard, stuff going into the top And they, the two mixers li- um, uh, ma- uh, match up to the two sets of level faders I have. Um, but I also have uh, mapped to the hardware. I can actually set the individual levels if I go back to... Um, the set this view Mm -hmm. Uh, if i move these two you can see those two knobs there and basically that's the top keyboard volume and the bottom keyboard volume so i can balance them uh, as i play which i tend to do between because even when you preset some of your levels and that before the gig uh, 
sometimes things are a bit different the the bass or the guitar may sound different in the room and i have to push certain sounds or pull certain sounds back not to mask other instruments so i keep a certain amount so when i said i'm i, I don't change buttons and that during the gig i lied i do i do ride the volume <laughs> yeah do you have it set up to when you open gig performer recall the last setting or a saved setting in those global global widgets um uh, i would tend to have it always pick up the saved setting okay um, because I, i've fallen foul of accidentally knocking something at the end of a, uh, at the end of a, a programming session and saving it i never save uh the gig when i close down gig performance at the end of a gig i never save because um you'll have i'll have knocked something during a song and that will get written to the uh the, the gig file and the next time you pull it up you won't know and you go to play a song and there's one of the sounds isn't there because you'd knocked yes. something yes which we don't ever want <laughs> no. so yeah so that's a pro tip right there post gig don't save because no. then it just reverts back to your rehearsal version yes yeah okay cool um all right so you guys you you mentioned this already you have a unique you have a unique use case because your band is a party band. And I, in one of our conversations, you've described it as um, you cannot ever stop Correct. during a show. Yeah. So yeah. that means no silence, no dinner breaks, nope. no pausing to talk about the next song. And your typical gig is quite long, right? What would you say an average gig is for you? An average gig is usually between two and a half and three hours. I mean, the longest we've done in recent years was probably about three and a half hours. Yeah, um, no stopping. Of no stopping, yeah, and no yeah. gaps between songs. If, if you leave a gap, people will sit down. So don't stop, and they won't sit down. Yes. yes. And, and it works. It, it's, um, it, it, I think particularly if you're going to be a band who's there to entertain the audience, then you've got to entertain them all the time you're there uh, if you you spend a couple of hours setting up and you spend another hour and a half packing down why would you go through all of that and then limit the enjoyable part of the gig yes yeah well and i don't know you were kind of saying you know your your like north star of success is to do it all the way do it like you mean it um yeah. so this is a part of that for sure yes yeah <laughs> um, absolutely you show up you play, it's a party the whole time. And what's required to make that work is seamless switching. Yes. yes so it is. talk to me about what you've built and why you've built it and how that all goes. Okay. If I uh, bring it up onto the screen. Yep. Just on my. Okay. This is uh, the extension that I've uh, created uh, to run within Gig Performer. Um, yes. I basic level um it does the same thing as the set list on the left hand side you can scroll up and down it and as you click each one it calls it up in gig performer wow that's really nice uh, the, uh, the difference we have is one obviously it's full screen so i as you can see i wear glasses to work i don't wear glasses when i play so i need big text so i can yep. see it um but also um our singer will typically turn around to us in the middle of one song and say the next song is going to be cuddly toy for instance so while i'm playing when I, when I get a free hand i can scroll down and i can say cuddly toys can mix and i can mark it so basically i'm bookmarking it yes and then as we get to the end of the previous song and we're going to start cuddly toy i then press the gray button and it switches to cuddly toy so it allows me to uh, prepare and be ready as stuff is called to me during the previous song and then i know you know, well, I, I basically, and also it's a reminder on screen of what's the next song because um, my, my sieve of a brain cannot always remember by the end of a song that the one we were going to do next was Cuddly Toy. And it avoids that horrible blank look where everyone looks at you and says, why aren't you starting the song? So, Right. And it also, it sort of capitalizes on what you can do, right? Yes. It's like, you can find the song quickly after he calls it while you're playing, as opposed to trying to remember something, which is more of a challenge, just capitalizes uh, on your ability. Exactly. Uh, it's the case of um, remove all the stuff you need to think about so you can um, 
uh, you, you can focus on the performance and not all the stuff that goes around it. Uh, yes. I mean, he may just say the next one's going to be paradise. So it's, I can either scroll down and find it or I can click in the field and an on-screen touchscreen keyboard comes up and I'll say PA and there's paradise. And I can in bookmark it, close it off. But you can do one handed while you play. Um, yes. And then when the song comes up, you can press the button uh, yeah. and just straight. And you're not even talking about having to do it with the whole, like, you know, you've typed two letters. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> and filters down, filters down to the ones that match. Yeah. And it's, it's very, it's quite snappy. It, it, yeah. I mean, really within, uh, you should be able to find any song within three letters of, yeah. of top of the name. It will appear on the screen it, that, yeah. I mean, uh, how often do you have um, more than say 10 songs that start with the same three letters? Not that often. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is insane. And gig performer, like what you just showed me, responds very fast yeah. so, oh it's, yeah, it's instantaneous as it's it's crazy i mean it's, it hooks straight into into gig performers api so yes. as you pre it's an instant it, it becomes i mean effectively it becomes part of gig performer right right and this is an extension that i i know you're kind of using your skills as a web designer for this a little bit this is is running as a website that, uh, yeah right? It is, yeah. Um, most extensions are written in C++, and this one, the basis of it, is in C++, the bit mm -hmm. that talks to Gig Performer. Um, doesn't have to be. There are other options, but that's yeah. the, the main one. Um, but for the display, my, all my, my well-rounded knowledge is with web pages. Yeah. So I wanted to be able to design a web page as the interface, uh, but then it talks um, in C++ into Gig Performer. Yeah. So and all this stuff, stuff I've done for years, the, these kind of UIs. Right. Right. And it and it just works, which is amazing. OK. The other thing that you didn't talk about, I mean, it's not not like it's super hidden, but you can see what time it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, which just, uh, it's, it's helpful. I, it, it's just so you know how long you've got to hold your bladder for before you right. can uh, go to the lyrics. <laughs> Do you have like a strong cutoff of, on when you stop intaking liquids before you start playing or? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> and it also depends on the, uh, how hot the room is. Uh, if it's a really hot room, you don't care because you know you'll sweat it out before yeah. you uh, yeah. get to that point. But other times, yeah, we do, you have to be, leave half an hour before you, uh, before you start playing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we're understanding your extension, which makes it really easy to switch, which I do at some point, perhaps this will be available for the general public, um, but not not yet. Right now, it's still kind of your beta phase. Uh, uh, yes, it is. Um, I will be actually releasing the source code of a basic version, um, so everyone will have the opportunity to have uh, like a template, so they could essentially even just change the 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 web based part of it um and then it's easy to hook it through into gig performance so hopefully it'll open up for more people to be able to get in and write their own extensions um once it's ready that that'll go on github and anyone will be able to download it and use it awesome awesome so let's make some sounds i want to hear something <laughs> what what are you excited about what do you think displays what you're doing really well um, um um, yeah, I think one of the uh, first ones is probably Radio Gaga. Okay. Because um, awesome. we have the, um, the obviously, the, the thing I said about re-triggering the arpeggiator every yep. bar. Yep. Um, so I'll just move that over because I've got the vocoder microphone here as well. Um, so, yeah, it'll just be... Yeah. Oh man. Okay. So, so much is happening there. Well, it's hilarious also to hear your vocoder and also hear your microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and it's it, trust me, it doesn't work like that when you do it live. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, amazing. So, 
what a fantastic, like, clear example of exactly what's possible. You're using, in this particular scenario, an arpeggiator, yeah. some sort of super saw synth, plus a vocoder, yeah. all at the same yeah. time. And some piano in there as well. And piano. Uh, can you uh, show fact, us the, the wiring for that? I can. Um, so uh, Omnisphere, uh, uh, that is doing the, the sequence bass part. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and I mean, I've got some, some extra mappings in there so that when we do the breakdown part, I can uh, do this. Uh, and that's just on the mod wheel. Yes. Uh, I've got a piano in there from P uh, Piano Tech. Okay. Um, the, the Super Saw sound is coming from a Juno 6 plugin. That's the Arturia one. Yeah, it's and then really had, nice. <laughs> yeah, and I had the Arturia Vocoder V uh, for, for the Vocoder. And it's using the internal synth uh, of Vocoder V for that. It just makes it easier. Yes. Uh, rather than have to have a separate synth, which you then have to patch in. Um, yeah, just for convenience, really. But but it's a great sound as well. Yeah, even with hearing your voice and the vocoder through the stream, you can tell that it's a very nice. It's yes. clear, it sounds yeah. it sounds pretty darn close to the song, right? I mean, it's it's the vocoder. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, um, absolutely. So <clears throat> this is just like a typical setup. Another thing I want to point out is that all of this was happening, and everybody could kind of see it with just your two hands yes right i mean and on one keyboard this wasn't even a double keyboard song uh not yeah yeah that again that's the of having the splits in certain yes. ways some of that is is kind of hangs over from the chronos where i had to do splits and that but um i, I think when you're doing covers there's a certain element of needing to sound like the original not entirely yeah. but i think it needs to be enough like the original for people to, uh, for the instant recognition. Yeah. And people get pumped if they're at a show and they hear the start of their favorite song and it sounds like their favorite song. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've got the <laughs> similar thing uh, with uh, Video Kill the Radio Star. Okay. And uh, uh, again, I need to put this in set list mode just to get that set up correctly. And I, I have a little thing where I can tap one of the pads um, just to change the sound between the first two uh, parts of the song. Uh, so I have. And yes. when I tapped the pad, um, all it was actually doing was uh, it's, it's attached to a widget and the widget blocks and unblocks um, MIDI on notes, which mm -hmm. go to the, the string sound. Yeah. Um, so are, are I, you doing I, that in the MIDI in block or are you doing that with a MIDI filter? In the MIDI in block, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the benefit being um, that it doesn't cut the sound off. Yes. Um, but if you use mute... Um, when you mute it, the, the sound just chops off where if you block the MIDI on note, uh, any notes will finish, they'll tail off um, and and you don't get that horrible cut off. But also if you only filter the MIDI on notes, then any, any note offs still go through and finish the note. Yes. Yeah. This is a wonderful trick for keyboard players blocking MIDI on notes. Um, yeah, I feel like it's been talked about a couple times now, but like the amount of digging I had to do to discover that was just yeah, yeah. and it works so much better than muting and unmuting stuff yes. or even bypassing and unbypassing. Yes, and uh, it gives you the the added benefit of you know a pseudo patch persist without changing variations or rack spaces. Exactly that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't interfere with the playing. You haven't got to think about anything. You can just switch it, and it. it, it it always sounds correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, which having also having the pad there kind of gives you the, the facility. You, there's something about hitting a button and then something happens that makes you feel like you're playing an instrument. Um, whereas sometimes too much automation can actually cause problems because you're, you're too disconnected from what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's right. 
um yeah a lot of times i feel like you know convenience comes at the cost of awareness right like uh, <laughs> uh, yeah I, and you always be need to be ready to react uh i think which is why we, i don't automate that much at all i'd rather play the stuff because yeah uh, I, I, we've never been a band who will play to backing tracks um, mm. because we like to be spontaneous. Um, and, and if the singer decides we're going to have a little break in the middle and he's going to talk to the audience in the middle of a song, you've got to have the flexibility to just stop playing or play a holding pattern while he does that. Yeah. Um, it's you, it, it, just so that you can support each other as you do your performance when somebody has a bright idea, oh, I'm going to suddenly do this. We need to be able to react to support that in a seamless way so that nobody knows that wasn't planned to do that. Mm -hmm. But quite often it isn't planned. We just yeah. you know, know what how to react. Yep. Absolutely. There's one guy that I work with um, who is so good at being spontaneous with tracks that it's almost like he's borderline DJing while he plays, while he sings. Anyway. Yeah. So it's like there are people who do it, but it's there is something about the tactile actually doing it. And also, the I feel like the audience can almost smell when you're playing or when you're tracking. Like they yeah. might not be able to tell you that they do. Yeah. But there's just some something. Oh, they'll also there'll always be a musician in the audience who spots it straight away. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'll be sitting I'll be standing at the back like this, watching. That's right. He's live tweeting, yeah. tagging you guys about how you're using your tracks and are not actually playing. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's hilarious. Um, okay, so what is? Are there any songs that at this point require significantly more focus for you than other tunes? Um. Yeah, there are one or two. Uh, I mean, obviously, some are just nice four chord turnarounds, but uh, I'm just, having, it's usually, sometimes it's when we have a song that we haven't played for a while. Sure, sure. Um, but probably one of the ones with more stuff going on is Uptown Funk. Yeah. Um, just trying to cover a certain amount of stuff because I've uh, I've obviously got I Am being the brass parts, the, the synth, um, and certain samples which are triggered as well. Yeah. So I'll have the usual brass run. The I've got that. What are you using for that sound? Uh, that's the Native Instruments Session Horns Pro. Wow. So it, it, it does proper. So when I'm doing the, it does proper divisi. So the notes mm -hmm. are assigned to each instrument. It's great because you can play it a bit as though it's a chord, but it, it is still split out uh, in the correct way. Yeah. I actually remember we were kind of chatting about this. So important to note that if you're covering horn parts, not only are you covering the horn part, but you're having to make it work on keyboard when it's arranged for horns. Yeah, and yeah, if... yeah. You have to, you have to think like like a horn player. Um, if you, any, I mean, anytime you're not you playing anything that's not piano or organ uh, or any keyboard based instrument, you have to play it in the style of that instrument. It's not just using the sound. Yeah. If you're playing guitar stuff, you almost have to semi strum it. Or, or if you're playing rock guitar, don't play chords, play power fifths and yes. things. And just knowing, um, having to think about how the player of that instrument would do it, uh, which is why to this day I never do a sax solo because it's just not that feasible on a keyboard. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. other things, yeah. just think about how the, the, the player would play themselves. So typically with brass, I'll play a lot of stuff two-handed. So you get the, the feel of two different players playing apart rather than putting in um kind of harmony notes which follow the main thing automatically that that's an immediate tell where if you play the harmonies mm -hmm. you get the slight variance that that you do with doing stuff manually yes. it makes it sound a, bit, sound a bit more like two horn players playing together a absolutely um and these are pro pro tips here right because like you know you may not hear the one thing that you're doing Right. You, like you might not hear that you're playing with two hands and you might not hear that you're voicing the chords correctly and you might not hear that you're strumming the guitar. But when you're doing all of those things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and again, it's, it's thinking about the voicings as well, because yeah. uh, if you're playing a strum sound, uh, it's it, it, just a strum of the fretboard requires two hands to get the spread. 
um, yes. of, of, of the strings are tuned to. Yes. If you play it as a chord, it not, doesn't sound the same as a guitar chord because there are different notes. Uh, they're spread across the octaves in a very different way. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So we're, we're, we're almost at an hour. So if you have questions for Dave, um, please put them in the comments because Dave is a master um, and has a lot of experience doing this. So all questions gig performer, all questions live performance. Um, Dave is also great with gear. So if you have gear questions, let him know that as well. Are we missing anything? Um, I know we talked a little bit about hardware. Do you use any of your custom hardware when you're playing with your band uh, or is that for uh, all studio? Uh, yeah, it's the, this more studio based okay. custom hardware. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dave is also a secret hardware designer. I don't know that it's a secret, but he's making, he makes uh, some yeah. pretty cool stuff. Um, uh, here's, here's the current project. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Why, why don't you go ahead and talk about that just because it's pretty cool. Um, uh, the idea is it's for composers using um, like the massive string libraries, um, like the Spitfire audio libraries and what have you. And you'll want to switch articulations um, as you write. Um, typically, when you play, you'll be playing one hand if you're doing a string part, and then you'll be adding the expression with sliders. So the idea of this item is, we'll get it right. That way. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's good. Do the sliders like that, and then your thumb just changes the buttons, and these buttons will send out the key switches into the, the software. Um, and and you've also got some uh, transport controls down that side uh, as well. Yeah. Um, it's just but it's trying to come up with something that's ergonomic uh, for to do a very specific job. Yes. Um, at some point, I will probably lend these ideas to something for gig performer. It's, uh, it, it, and again, it's just thinking about what would be, because I, I still don't have the ideal controllers I'd like for a gig. Yes. Um, the the drum pads I use have a couple of sliders, a couple of knobs, a couple of switches, plus the pads. Mm -hmm. It gives me just enough, but uh, there's still a few extra things I, I wish it did. Yeah. And I think the way to get that is to bespoke build something. Yeah. Yep. Uh, there's something to be said for building your own stuff because gig performer is that, right? <laughs> I mean, gig performer is building your own thing. So, yeah. um, and I know lots of different people have different answers to that, but I actually do a lot of music notation and um, articulations and expressions are a big challenge. So yeah. um, Peace Frogs Den says, thanks for the overview to both of you. My first time seeing gig performer in action. So thank you I for that. Um, so Dave, I ask everybody this question. You probably know it's coming cause you, you're always on the stream cheering us on. If someone's brand new with gig performer and they're just getting started, what, what, uh, words of wisdom, tips, tricks, advice do you have for them if they're brand new? Uh, I probably have two. Okay. Uh, the first one is the one that's been said many, many times. Join the forum. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, it's a wealth of knowledge there. It's the place to go and ask questions. Somebody will answer it. And no yep. matter how wild the question is, you'll get a sensible answer. Um, but the second, the more important one, I think, from, from my experience, is to be prepared to unlearn the way you think it should be done. Mm. Because uh, more than once, I actually submitted ideas saying, I think this gig performer should do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, David comes with his usual lovely comments of saying, why do you want to do that? Yeah. And, uh, and but uh, uh, through a process, you reevaluate why you want to do that. And then you come to realize, oh, actually, the way the gig performer leans towards doing some of these things is hard won knowledge from the trenches. Yeah. And it does it that sort of way because there's a very, very good reason for it. Um, so I'd say, yeah, be prepared to unlearn the way you think you should do it and open your mind a bit and accept other ideas for how you can achieve the same thing because it may end up being better than, than the way you wanted to do it. Yeah, absolutely. That is super valuable. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, gig, nothing in Gig Performer is an accident. <laughs> um, so, you know, and there's often more than one way to do things, but if you, you know, have the open mind like you're recommending, 
um, you kind of get the benefit of, you know, you bring some of yourself to the stream, but you also, you know, bring um, some of the acquired hive mind of knowledge of performers yeah. using this for the last four versions to use. Yes. Um, so, you know, you're inheriting their wisdom, which is, is a beautiful thing. Um, Corne says, I like the extensions you programmed, maybe in the next gig performer update, um, which I know you mentioned, you're, you're going to release the source code at some point. Uh, yeah. And it probably will be with the next update. Um, it'll yeah. go onto, onto GitHub. Um, at the moment I can, I'll release the source code. I can release, um, a windows, uh, plugin version so that anyone with windows will be able to use it straight away without having yeah. to build it. I'm yeah. yet to solve the way to build it on a Mac. Yeah. Um, but once that's sorted, yes, it'll be there available to everyone to, to try out. It just sort of feels like there's so much that's available for Mac that maybe this should just be an excellent Windows. <laughs> it's just a shout out to the Windows users. Um, yeah. Because this this live setup is super stable, super flexible, and completely on Windows. So it's, I mean, it's happening and it's, you know, happening at a yeah. very high level. So um, it's doable, but... Um, certainly not second rate in the gig performer universe. Um, everything is possible in both, in both areas. Um, all right, friends. Well, Dave, thank you. Um, this has been amazing. Where can people hear your music, um, recorded live? How do people find you on social media? How, like what's, where do we go? Um, I for social media, um, I think there's some links below the video. All to, in the to description, the by the way. But tell us the platforms um, and, and all of that stuff. Um, we're on Facebook. Uh, we're on Instagram. Um, so you can just um, uh, just search for Marilabone Jelly. Marilabone as in the station, mm -hmm. Jelly as in the wobbly stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you want to hear us, um, just go to your, your Amazon Echo and just say, Alexa, play Marilabone Jelly. I did it quietly because there's one behind me. Everybody's is going off across the world right now at the same time because of the live stream. Um, yeah. Okay, so it works on um, She Who Will Not Be Mentioned, which is what we lovingly refer to that as in our it, house. It's on all of them, really, because we're on, we're on Spotify and uh, just about uh, Amazon Music, just about every one of the, the streaming platforms. And live gigs, where do we hear about those? Uh, website um, or Facebook? Um, yeah, you go to our Facebook page, and you will uh, you'll see updates of, of when we're playing. Uh, obviously, we're UK based and in the mm -hmm. southeast. But yeah, if anyone is uh, happens to be in the area, do please come along and do please come and say hello. Um, yeah. it's, it should be great to meet people who find out about us online. Yeah, um, all of these links you can find in the description right now. Um, so go check out what they're doing, support them. Um, Dave has been a massive supportive of gig, supporter of Gig Performer, so uh, please go support his playing. Um, Dave, thank you so much. Friends who are watching, we will be back this Saturday at noon, so we're getting two in one week. Um, so do uh, tune into that. Dave, thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you all next week, or not next week, on Saturday, uh, on the next episode of Backstage. Have a wonderful day, friends.